now, HBO Sports presents Boxing After Dark. Mohegan Sun in Uncasville, Connecticut. It's HBO's Boxing After Dark. Tonight we bring you a unification fight in the 140 pound division as 23 year old St. Louis native Devin Alexander, one of the sport's brightest young stars, faces his toughest test so far in Juan Urango of Colombia. Devin Alexander is 19 0 with 12 knockouts. He hails from North St. Louis. We'll tell you more about his improbable story a little bit later on in the show. Meanwhile, he'll be taking on a very tough veteran in Juan Urango. He's 29 years of age. He fights out of Florida. Only two losses, those coming to Ricky Hatton and Andre Berto in his career. Hello again, everyone. So glad you can join us for HBO's Boxing After Dark. I'm Bob Papa. What a fight we have for you in the 140-pound weight class. You know, you take a look at Devin Alexander. He beat Junior Witter in his last fight, sort of like earning his college degree. But if he wants to move on to graduate school, he has the toughest test of his career in Juan Urango. Urango has held the belt since 2006, losing it to Ricky Hatton, but then winning it back. He's tough. He's rugged. Two different styles that will step in the ring tonight here on HBO's Boxing After Dark. And I'd like to welcome in HBO boxing analyst Max Kellerman. And Max, when you take a look at this fight tonight and the landscape of the 140-pound weight class, it's chock full of potential. The 140 pounders are incredibly deep. First, the belt holders. Tim Bradley, Timothy Bradley is the leader of the pack. Amir Khan has maybe potentially the best star kind of quality. Devin Alexander, we'll see after tonight. Juan Urango, as you mentioned, a tough, rugged veteran. Other notables at 140 pounds. Marcos Maidana, speaking of rugged customers. Pauli Malinaji, slick boxer, coming off a win against Juan Diaz. Mabuza just beat up Kendall Holt, longtime stalwart in the division. Victor Ortiz, sensational young prospect who made Donna upset not long ago. Ortiz has a knockout win since then. Ricky Hatton, the longtime lineal champion of the division, got blitzed by Manny Pacquiao, who moved up. Katelnik, good fighter, held the belt for a while. Lamont Peterson, also a good, young, talented fighter, lost to Bradley, but still deserves mention. Nate Campbell, longtime lightweight contender, now campaigning at 140 pounds. You know, this happens from time to time throughout the history of boxing. There, a, a dominant champion, a star, either loses or retires or leaves the division, and there's sort of a natural process to replace him. Happened in the 1980s with Sugar Ray Leonard at welterweight, and Donald Curry emerged as the guy. At middleweight, Michael Nunn emerged as the guy when Marvin Hagler left. And here, Ricky Hatton's knocked out by Manny Pacquiao. Pacquiao's now at welterweight. And we have a sort of informal tournament at 140 pounds. As I mentioned, Timothy Bradley it has to be considered at this moment the leader of the pack. But Devin Alexander is as talented as anyone in the division and maybe in boxing. And we'll see where he ranks in this pack, which, as I mentioned, is very deep after tonight. And that's the special part about tonight. We'll get a chance to see two of those pieces in the puzzle move around a little bit in the 140-pound landscape. Well, to be a professional athlete at an elite level, it's a wild game of chance. But for Devin Alexander out of North St. Louis, his story is even greater. He has bucked improbable odds to get to this point along with his trainer, Kevin Cunningham. <laughs> Thank you. 
anything can happen at any particular moment. Every day you will hear somebody getting killed on our street, somebody going to jail, somebody fighting, getting stabbed. The Hyde Park area of North St. Louis paints a bleak picture for its children, a place where teddy bears mark the spot of homicides. You'll see drive-by, you'll see arguing, you'll see fighting, you'll see guns, you know, just violence, so it was very rough. In the early 1990s, a neighborhood police officer and former amateur boxer named Kevin Cunningham had seen enough. As a police officer, basically, you're just riding around waiting to get bad news all day. I was like, maybe we need to do something on the front end where we could prevent some of this crime with these youth from happening. With the help of the city of St. Louis, he set up a boxing gym in the basement of an abandoned police station, hoping to keep kids away from the dangers of street life. Right here was the ring. And then he had speed bags and jump ropes back on the other side of the room over here. And Kevin would bring those kids down here after school. They couldn't wait to get down here to get to Kevin and uh, gain that knowledge that he had about the sport, about boxing. One of those kids was seven-year-old Devin Alexander, finally able to attend along with his two older brothers, Lamar and Vaughn. I never got a chance to go because my mom wouldn't let me, but Vaughn went first and then we came and I was so excited the first day I came, I was doing jumping jacks, I was doing everything, so I was excited to be in the gym. I put gloves on him and I worked the pads with him for the first time and just the sound, pop, 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 and he would stop and just start smiling. I was just so excited to be in the gym and in the environment where there's no negativity. I hated to see fights. I hated to see arguing. I mean, that just was me. I always just loved to go to the gym and fight and train. Alexander had found his outlet, a way to fend off the lure of life in the street. But as the boys grew older, not all were able to resist the temptations. As time went on, I could see people straying away yeah, a guy named Johnny Hubbard, he got killed and shot in the head. That was the first of what started to be just everything unraveling. Um, Johnny, you had Willie Ross, you had Terrence Walker. I mean, just falling apart. Cunningham says that of the 30 kids who started training with Devin Alexander in Hyde Park, more than half are now dead or have spent time in jail. Every day in the gym training, you think about the talent of, of a lot of the kids that we had. They were just as gifted as Devin, and if they would have just stayed focused, they could have kind of gotten themselves out of, out of the conditions that they fell victim to. It's motivation. It's all motivation. Because you, you got to understand, I was with these guys for years, and they was like brothers to me. His brother Vaughn, once a promising professional himself, is now among those incarcerated. He was hanging out with the wrong type of people, and everybody knew it. My coach knew it, I knew it, my mom knew it, and he started to drink. He just kept doing the bad stuff that he knew that he was supposed to do, so now he's facing the consequences for it. An 18-year sentence for assault and robbery ended Vaughn's career in 2004, but Devin managed to stay on track, turning pro that same year and winning a title last summer at the tender age of 22. I mean, to, to take a kid, a, a little, little seven-year-old kid, from not knowing how to tie up a boxing glove to, to being champion of the world, it, I mean, it's an amazing feeling. To be honest, without Kevin, I don't think I'll be in the position that I am right now. If it weren't for him stepping in and starting that gym and giving me something to do and giving me something to look forward to, I don't think I'll be where I am today. Truly a remarkable story. And when we spoke with Devin yesterday, he mentioned that he spoke with his brother from prison and his brother gave him the same advice he always does. Good luck and go do what you do best. We know Devin Alexander has an unbelievable amount of character. What about, Max, the things that you love about him from a boxing standpoint? Well, he's an elite talent, but there's a difference between skill and talent. I love what Devin Alexander is trying to do with the talent, the way he's trying to apply his craft. Alexander is trying to become my personal favorite kind of boxer, the kind of guy who stands in front of his man, slips and counters, controls the action, moves his hand, stays in punching range, really boxes without running, without holding. It's the hardest style to master in boxing. But if mastered, I think, is the most effective style 
and it's a pleasure to watch. And we're going to get a chance to see it tested in an ultimate test tonight against someone like Juan Urango, former undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, and HBO boxing analyst Lennox Lewis joins us as well here at ringside for tonight's action. And Lennox, Juan Urango, I mean, he's coming off a defining win in his last fight. He had to get up off the deck. He's tough. He's rugged. What problems does he bring into the ring against someone like Alexander? Well, you know, you look at him. He's physically fit strong muscle bound and his style of boxing he comes at you he's trying to really mix it up one dimensional he's trying to hit you to the body hook you to the head and the kind of boxers that give him problems are the guys that give him lateral movement and throw the jab so if he's able to impose his will in this fight today he should do well two interesting styles as we take a look at the tail of the tape for alexander and urango alexander 23 years of age Urango is 29. Both made the 140-pound weight limit. With ease, Alexander rehydrated on our unofficial scales to 147 pounds. Urango up to 151. Time for the rules with our unofficial ringside scorer, Harold Letterman. The Devin Alexander one Urango fight is scheduled for 12 rounds using the unified rules of the Association of Boxing Commission. There is no three knockdown rule. Only the referee can stop the fight. In case of cut is caused by an accidental headbutt, we go to the scorecards after four rounds have been completed, and you cannot be saved by the bell at any round, including the 12th and final round. Bob! All right, Harold Juan Urango, Iron Twin is ready to go. Born in Columbia, fighting out of Miami, and he's coming off a very impressive win back in August against Randall Bailey. Max. He got dropped in the sixth round. Randall Bailey might be the best pure puncher in boxing with any one shot. Uh, and, and the fact that he knocked Juan Urango down, it was such a great chin. Urango got up from that, and that was bad news for Randall Bailey. Bailey was down twice in the ninth round and got finished off in round number 11. Also got hurt in round number 10. But it was Urango's determination and sort of that will to just keep firing away that was the key. Five-time Colombian national champion in the amateurs. What a unique story. I mean, he grew up on a farm in Colombia, had a wild partying type life, has found religion, is newly married a couple of years ago, now a family man, has tremendous inner strength. And, and, and tremendous outer strength. <laughs> I mean, this is a strong, tough, rugged guy. He followed up that Andre Berto lost with that impressive win against Randall Bailey. And Juan Urango is a lunch pail kind of guy, and he's going to just dig in. He doesn't really care what Alexander brings to the table. He's going to just fight his style fight, and that's pressure, pressure, and more pressure against the young Alexander. I got a million ways to get it. She was one. And 23-year-old Devin Alexander the Great. Been inactive since August the 1st when he beat Junior Witter. He says, listen, I fight every month, what he told us. And he says he got frustrated at times with it, Lennox. But, you know, he's maintained his poise for a guy who just turned 23. Very mature kid, as we saw on the piece. You know, Alexander, for a guy who's been inactive, is still only 23 years old because he turned pro so young still isn't in what is typically thought of as a fighter's physical prime, and yet already has a belt. Told us, it's in me to just be great. I feel very blessed. Time for the formal introductions as we send it to the ring and Michael Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to a place like no other in the world, the Mohegan Sun, located here in Uncasville, Connecticut, USA, where tonight, Don King Productions is proud to present on HBO Boxing After Dark a world title unification contest. 12 rounds of boxing for the WBC IBF Super Lightweight Championship of the World. Presented in association with Warriors Boxing and Gym, sanctioned by the Mohegan Tribe Department of Athletic Regulation, supervising at ringside, Mike Mazzulli and Mike Murtha. Tribal Chairwoman Lynn Mallerbe. Vice Chairman Bruce Bosom. WBC President Jose Suleiman. IBF President Marion Mohammed. In attendance at ringside, scoring this bout on the 10 point must system are our three judges Omar Mintoon, Don Trella, and Steve Weisfeld. 
And at the bell, the man in charge of the action, referee Benji Estevez. And now with dedication to the men and women who serve in harm's way for the armed forces of the United States of America, from the Mohegan Sun Arena, for the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! <laughs> Fighting out of the blue corner, wearing blue with silver, officially weighing in at 139 three quarter pounds. His professional record, an excellent one. 22 victories, including 17 knockouts, with only two defeats and one draw. Originally from Colombia, now training and fighting out of Miami, Florida, the reigning and defending IBF Junior Welterweight Champion of the World, Juan Iron Twins. Ooh. And fighting out of the red corner, wearing red with silver, official weight, 139, one quarter pounds. His professional record, a perfect one. 19 fights, 19 victories, including 12 knockouts from St. Louis, Missouri, USA. The reigning, defending, and undefeated WBC super lightweight champion of the world, Devin. Alexander the Gray. One second, let me get some of these. Juan, voy a repetir mis instrucciones. Devin, I'm going to repeat my instructions. Protege durante la pelea todo el tiempo. Protect yourself during the fight at all times. Tengo una pelea limpia. Give me a nice clean match. Que gana el mejor. May the best man win. Touch him up. Good luck to both of you. In spite of where Devin Alexander's from, if you watched that piece, you know. He's never been in a fight outside of the ring. Never been in a street fight. Juan Urango is going to try to introduce him to one here. How tough is Devin Alexander? How good? is Devin Alexander. Alexander told us, I'm going to open up the beast in me. And Urango's the kind of guy that would bring it out of you. Urango told us, I'm ready to go 12 rounds, but I'll let my power do my talking. Rest assured, the man in blue will want to attack that body of Alexander. And Alexander's looking quite good right now. He's throwing that jab out nice and crisp. Hard and sharp. Alexander <laughs> looking to work off that jab. Rango could be wide with his punches. Nice uppercut thrown by Alexander. You know, Urango, he, he seems like he's trying to find the way in right now. Just watching Alexander, not getting hit with anything, trying to figure out how, how can I get in. But Alexander's doing the right thing. He's using lateral movement, staying sweet on his feet. Alexander's not known as a big puncher, but he has consistently, even as he's moved up in competition, been able to consistently hurt stun world-class fighters and you saw here in the first round he was able to at least momentarily it seems stun Juan Urango. Unless there's a way isn't there to use lateral movement but not get out of range isn't there? Yeah and you know really what you need to do is just step to the side whether it's the right side or the left side. You know Alexander's a southpaw so he you know he's electing to go more to his right. But any moment, he can always switch to his left. Now for your angle, he's, you know, he's one-dimensional. He likes to come forward for, to make him stop and switch. You know, then he has to start everything over again. To point out, two minutes into the fight, there's the first clinch. 
Alexander hasn't been running or clinching, and he has been moving his hands. Boxing very well. Alexander sticking to his game plan. And for Urango, sort of just kind of bore your way in, try to get physical with Alexander. And you see when Urango tries to come in, Alexander throws that right check hook. And really, it's like a matador type of thing. Good right hand there from Urango. Yeah. Clean right hook. Stop at the bell. Tried it again, but he missed it. Alexander darted away from danger there. End of one round, scheduled for 12. Oh, Cal, get down, man. Okay. Only time he caught you because you standing straight up in the air catching them looping ass shots. Get down, man. Get your shit off and get down, man. That's unnecessary, man. Get focused, dude. Right. This is easy work if you stay focused. Do what we did for eight weeks in camp, and that's get your work off, get your ass. You understand? He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to exchange. What he wants to do is just run, run, run. That's all. Just touch you every so often, and and keep ca trying to catch you when you come on the inside. Listen to me. You got to get him to the body. Touch him to the body. Touch him to the body, champ. Okay. And here you see Alexander throwing an uppercut, trying to come back with a right left. And here we see later on, hitting him with a left hand. Alexander stayed consistent in the first round with his jab, although he landed only eight of them. He did throw 49 to try to control distance. Nice right hook to the body. One of the reasons By I think Alexander's attempted style is so admirable is there's inherent risk. There's danger. It's not like what Birdo did against Durango, which was turn it into a kind of non-contact affair and totally control him with his hand speed, but also his foot speed. Alexander's attempting to control Urango in the middle of the ring without so much movement that he's out of punching range, and it's more dangerous. Yeah, very dangerous, because you got a guy that throws a right hook like that and a left hook to the body. You know, you don't want to be in his punching range. Alexander trying to work the outside and get that jab going. Durango tries to jab his way in. It's 1-2 from Alexander. And you can tell Alexander's trying to keep it in the center of the ring. He's using his boxing. He's using that reach. You know, later on in the fight, he needs to just step in a little bit more, closer to his opponent. Time, Alexander threw a hook to the body himself. <laughs> There's the movement from Alexander trying to get away from those hooks from Urango. See what Alexander has to worry about. He's just going out there throwing one jab. And after a while, Urango's gonna time that and come across with his own punches. So he's gotta really mix up his punches right now and not throw that one jab all the time. You know what I do like about his jab though, Lennox? In the past, we've seen Alexander kind of flick out a bunch of jabs without seeming to intend to land any of them. At least here, it seems like he's trying to find a home for the jab. Yeah, I mean. Urango's face. He's still a he's about one step out of reach. If he steps in one more foot, he'll be in great punching range to throw some shots. But like you said, he has to be careful because it's dangerous, because he's in against a strong man. Alexander doing a nice job of controlling the distance here in the second round. He steps in with a combination to end that round. Champion. Jeff, you okay? Yeah. You're okay? Everything's good? Yeah. All right, listen now, listen. 
Listen, you're letting him, you're letting him box. You understand? There is Sharon Alexander, the mother of Devin Alexander, here to see her son fight. She, along with her husband, Lamar Jackson, raised 13 children. Lamar passed away on June the 3rd of 2004, a day in which Devin was scheduled to fight. He went through with the fight that night. His brother Vaughn, who we chronicled in the piece, who's now in jail, also fought on that card. So that's what my dad would want me to do. After Devin won the championship in his last fight, he slept with that championship belt and brought it to his father's gravesite the next day. Rugged Ron, Juan Urango getting ready for the start of round number three, trying to press Alexander. Nice. what'd you think of what they said in the corner of Urango about you're letting Alexander, but you're letting him do what he wants to do? Well, like I said, you know, for him to, Urango to really show a good force in this fight, he needs to impose his will on him. And it's, you know, it's difficult against a mover because this is the kind of guys he has problems against. And until he works out how to how to beat these types of guys that throws good jabs and that moves well, you know, he's going to be. So what do you do? What do you do? Well, what he's doing right now, you know, step up the pace a little bit more. He tried punching Alexander on the hip a couple times. Really attack that body and slow him down. I'll tell you what, he's finding success. He found it in the first round and momentarily there with the right hook. It's a sneaky right hook from Urango that seems to hurt Alexander as, as big and strong as Urango is. He can make a lot of mistakes and make up for it with one of those right hooks. It looks like Urango has a cut. Alexander's never been down in his career, by the way, whether in a pro fight, in the gym, in the amateurs, something he takes great pride in. And that cuts in a bad area as well. That cut against Bailey did Urango. Cut opened up in round number two. Let me tell you, Alexander throws a great uppercut. He's had good success with it so far. He also, Alexander, showing remarkable discipline here when he's been hurt with those right hooks. He's neither shied away from the fight, nor has he kind of gotten out of his game plan. He seems to just refocus and, and try to do what he's doing, but with better intensity. Alexander did something right there. Urango ran in at him, and Alexander just threw a straight left. Ooh, Alexander just veered away from that right hook to the head from Urango. And that's what he has to watch out, watch out for. Lennox, why is he getting hit with that right hook by Urango? Well, he's, you know, he's not used to Urango's right hooks, for one thing. And until he gets used to it, I break, so I can, you know, he's going to get hit by it. Or until he makes that adjustment, he's going to get hit. So he needs to make that adjustment. And, and we spoke right, no about that guys, no in fighters meeting. He said that he has to watch out for his hook, and he's going to keep that left hand up. So he's definitely aware of it. He's got to make that adjustment pretty soon. Well, you know, after he throws his combination, he's got to put up that left hand straight away. You can almost feel a little momentum swing here in this third round with Durango starting to dig in a little bit more. Right, work out, work out, step out. At the bell. Coming to the end of round number three. Scheduled for 12, Durango and Devin Alexander. Well, immediately following the conclusion of our telecast, stay tuned for the premiere of Road to Dallas, Pacquiao versus Claudia. An in-depth look into the lives and training camps of Manny Pacquiao and Joshua Claudia as they prepare for their pay-per-view showdown next Saturday night. And later tonight, catch a replay of Magic and Bird, A Courtship of Rivals, a film that chronicles the historic rivalry between NBA legends Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. I need a Vaseline. You must let your hands go, champ. Everything's okay. Everything's okay. Sort of feel a little bit of the power surge from Juan Urango in round number three as he landed some good hooks against Devin Alexander. Round number four underway. Let's bring in our unofficial ringside scorer, Harold Letterman. Okay, Bob. Three to nothing. Third
Third and a 27, Devin Alexander. You know, Bob, for two rounds, Devin Alexander was hitting a heavy bag. I mean, Juan Urago just wasn't busy enough, didn't do nothing. Devin kept popping him with that right jab, the right uppercuts, an occasional right hook. Urago was looking at him. In round three, all of a sudden, Juan Urago felt that blood coming down into his left eye and went to work, got a little bit busier. And that's what he's got to do to win a round. Round three, Alexander was still too busy with the right hand. Too many clean, effective punches. Three to nothing, Alexander. I don't think, I agree with your score, Harold. I don't think it's a question of just busyness with your angle. It's one punch. It's the right hook that he's, that he's finding a home for. And Alexander somehow has yet to figure out how to avoid it. Bob Papa, Lennox Lewis, Max Kellerman from the Mohegan Sun. Busy night here on HBO. Oh, step out, step out. With Magic and Bird. The documentary earlier this evening. You'll see it in a rebroadcast later tonight. And of course, Road to Dallas following our live boxing action from the Mohegan Sun. Devin Alexander, Juan Urango, each putting their 140 pound belts on the line tonight. You know, I haven't seen Juan Urango throw too many jabs out there. He's, you know, he's not one of those kind of guys that throw a jab. He always leads with that right hook. So and there's an adjustment Alexander just started to make. Last two right hooks, three right hooks that Urango threw. Alexander's elbow is more tucked, and therefore his fist is higher to his chin, and he blocked all three. Let me tell you, when I go in there against hookers, used to go in there against hookers, I used to keep that right hand up high, because I knew that was the punch, that was their sweet punch, and I didn't want to get hit by it. What are some of the things that Urango could do to deliver more of them and even more effective. Well, you know, he oh, needs to control the left right there. Yeah, double double hooks. If one hook's working, throw double, triple. Ron Urangos seem like he slowed down a little bit. All right, great. Step back, step back. That time. Alexander kept his left hand up and he blocked that hook from Urango to the head. He made that adjustment, I think, earlier in the round, and, and Urango has yet to, to land that hook since then. He got tangled a little bit. Good one, too, from Alexander. Sometimes in some of Alexander's fights, you know, they say he doesn't turn over his gloves as much, but he seems like he's turning over his hands a bit more and getting some more power of, out of his punches. There goes that uppercut again. Durango charges, but the bell stops him. End of round four. As, as, we, as we go out, bring this crunch a little bit. Everything is good. Go down here. Alex, Alexander's done a pretty good job being able to use the uppercut effectively in the hook to get to the head of Juan Urango. Well, if you notice, Juan Urango, every time he starts out a punch, he puts his head down, he dips first. So the uppercut is a great weapon to use against him. Well, we talked about that cut on the left side of Urango's face. Well, Alexander's done a lot of work to the head as we take you to punch zone. And you see the effectiveness where you've seen 49 punches to the hand, 28 to the chin. Not really working on the body. That's where Urango wants to hit Alexander, but Alexander's been effective with those hooks and those shots to the head and with the uppercut. Right. KSA, KSA. Let's go. As we begin round number five. No knockdowns to this point. And Lennox, let me ask you this. You, you made an interesting point last round about how Urango will sort of dip down on his way in. Can Alexander do a feint of some sort to force Urango's hand and then counter it? Absolutely. I mean, um, in some cases, you know, he, he does do that. He sees him coming and he dips to one side and throws that right uppercut, which has worked work out, work out, very work effectively in the last few rounds. One thing Alexander needs to be doing is making him pay every time he misses. A big guy like that, you know he's coming with a heavy shot. So once he misses with that shot, you gotta make him pay. According to the CompuBox numbers, already in the fight, 
Alexander's thrown more jabs, 214, than Urango has thrown total punches, 199. So he's trying to neutralize that hard charging power of Urango with his jab. Alexander blocked most of that hook, that second hook that came with the right hand from Durango. Alexander's, you know, he still has to keep keep up the intensity. He has to hit Durango because if Durango feels that you're not hurting him, he's just going to walk right through your punches and come in there and hit you. So you got to make a man respect you. It's why it's such a good test for Alexander. As skillful, as talented as he is, can he... Can his skill, can he impose his skill? Does he have the discipline to do it on Urango's physical force and his will? Urango is very strong-willed, not just physically strong. And, 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 and so far, Alexander, you have to say, has remained calm in the face of Urango's pressure. Nice combination to the body there by Urango. That's his bread and butter. And it looks like he has stepped up the pace a little bit more, realize, realizing the need that he needs to score more points and connect a bit more. Good right hook to the body by Urango. Alexander goes to the body. Good combination. So Alexander has this calculus. As Lennox said, he has to make Urango respect him, but he doesn't want to get into a firefight with a guy of Urango's physical strength. And a guy that, in your ring, that walked through Randall Bailey, a pure puncher in his last fight and route to a win. We can't get like a day school in here now, all right? Because things going your way, don't get like a day school. Because what he's trying to do is slowly but surely touch you here, touch you there, all right? We ain't having that. Keep him in check with your jab. All right, give him feints, all right? Drop your combinations, get down around the corner, touch him again, all right? Hold your hands on this one. All right? Slide around him and step around him, all right? All you got to do is touch him and slide around him and step around and touch him again, all right? But stay focused. You starting to drop... Second throw. Well, you heard... Trainer Kevin Cunningham used that jab in the last round, according to CompuBox. Threw 49 jabs, landed 12 of them, 24%. Durango threw 52 punches the entire round. I got, I got to say, I thought that was great corner work by Kevin Cunningham, um, Alexander's trainer. You know, when you fight as Alexander's trying to fight, the danger is that if things are going your way, or maybe even if they're not, you can't retain the kind or maintain the kind of intensity it takes to control your opponent in this way round yeah, after round. Yeah, well, and yeah, Cunningham well, felt right then was the right time to give him a little reminder. No, 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 no. We have to do every round like the first one. It's an intriguing fight, you know, Lennox and Max, because you feel like Alexander is winning the fight and maybe even comfortably when you look at it round by round. But you also feel like you might be like right on the edge that Urango can turn it around fast. He could if he catches him with a good punch, but you know, Alexander's boxing very well. He's doing the right thing. The intensity's still there. He's not making any mistakes at all. And you can tell he wants to win this fight. He knows how to win this fight. He knows that he has to box, use that jab, and that's what he's doing. He is, but Bob, to your point, I think there's added drama because Urango needs to land his Sunday punch, it seems, to win. But he's shown the ability to land that hook already. He's shown that he can hit Alexander cleanly. And so, you know, if you've seen him do it before, even though Alexander's made some nice adjustments, you think maybe he can do it again. You're right. He has made some adjustments, and the speed level is still there. You know, you could say Urango's kind of slowed down on the speed a little bit, but the power and intensity is kind of sp speed up. Time Urango doubled up that right hook, went to the body and the head, now trying to maul Alexander a little bit. Boy, Alexander staying true to his form and technique. And throwing some good combinations. 
Alexander blocked most of that from Urango. You know, everybody loves to see these type of fights where there's one guy is, you know, is surging in, coming in, and he's throwing big shots, and you never know if it's going to land or not. This makes for an exciting fight. Informed by Benji Stevis, the referee, that that little cut that was on the left eye of Uranga was caused from a punch. I asked him in between rounds and confirmed it was a punch. Although his corner has done a good job of controlling that, it has not been a factor. Uranga shoots that left hand. And Alexander dances away to the end of round number six. Midway point of the fight. Tune in to the next Real Sports on Tuesday, March 16th to find out what happens when three married men who happen to be sports writers in major markets begin the process of becoming women after deciding they were born into the wrong bodies. Saturday, April 10th marks the return of our Emmy Award winning reality series 24 7. This time we'll take our cameras from the press tour to training right, camps here, in Miami, here, Las Vegas, and need, Big Bear, California, as we follow Floyd Mayweather and Shane Mosley as they prepare for their highly anticipated mega fight on May the 1st. Don't get caught up in exchanges with this dude, man. You're boxing too good. You don't need this. Campion, campion. Champ, champ, champ. He's getting tired, champ. Pressure him. Round number seven underway. Let's check in once again with Harold Letterman. Okay, Bob. Five to one. 59, 55. Devin Alexander. <coughs> I'm sorry, Bob. I got to tell you, I think that he's boxing beautifully. But in round six, Juan Urango certainly caught up to him, landed hard hooks, and won the sixth round. Five to one, Alexander. Wow, Harold emotional about this. <laughs> Actually, get him a water. I think he had a frog in his throat. <laughs> I think Harold's scorecard, as usual, is very good. And I should say that around boxing, there was a feeling by some. I think most felt that Alexander's too skillful for Urango heading into this fight. But there were those who liked Urango. And what they would point to is that over the second half of the fight, where Alexander's never been in with a guy like this on this level, this physically strong, that Urango would start to impose himself, in himself physically to where he might stop Alexander late. And it is interesting that the first round Harold gives to Urango is the last round of the first half of the fight. Here we are in the second half. You know, two years ago, he went 12 with Chop Chop poorly. Uh, won an easy 12-round decision against the veteran. He strung together four consecutive knockout wins, but you know Urango not going to go anywhere. So it's, I find it intriguing how this could play out over these final half of the fight. There's a right hook to the chin as Alexander leans away. Good counter shot by Alexander. See, I love when a guy throws four punch combination because you think he's going to stop on two, but yet, yet two more punches come. And that same left hand that Alexander just caught Urango with was consistently seeming to hurt Junior Witter. But Urango's chin is a different story. Urango digging in with those power punches, gets that hook, and that time the right hand found the mark. Alexander, see you now. You see they're throwing out a couple one-twos, but the two in the one-two, the straight left hand, was almost a stay-off-me punch, not really a, the kind of accurate left hands he was throwing earlier in the fight. And Lennox, there we saw Alexander throw four, and it was number four that landed. Yeah. And they were straight punches, too, which are important. Wide body shots from Urango.
combination from Urango. Alexander had it in range. Lunging shot from Urango to end round number seven. Good box. Hey, give me a wet towel. Somebody give me a wet towel, man. Wet a, wet a towel. Oh, you got, yeah, give me that stick. Give me the sponge. Let me wipe this. Me entiende? You understand? You are a man. He's not. He is not. You understand me? This is a fight. This is a fight. You understand that? He's never been in a fight like this. You understand that? He's never been. You've got to pressure him, Jim. You've got to throw those punches. You've got to look for his body. Look for his body. Look for his body. For his body. Dig in. Don't stop. Don't stop. He's going down. Now, interesting in round number seven, Urango landed 19 of 45 of his power punches, 42%. He landed 10 more power shots than Alexander, who was 9 of 27. We'll see if Urango employs his corner strategy of, you are a man, he is not this round. Lennox, I mean, when you look at a guy like Urango, and we, we chronicled it at the beginning of the night, I got off the deck against a pure puncher like Randall Bailey, and he wore him down in the late stages of the fight, and he wins it. It's got to give you confidence, even if things might not be totally going your way, to know that you can do that. Yeah, you can. I mean, pressure breaks the pipe. Oh! oh. oh. Uppercut knocked down Urango. Well, he got off the deck against Bailey to win. Can he do it again? He's, we talked about that experience in the last fight. He's going to have to summon that again. And he's hurt again, and down he goes again. Three, cuatro, Yo, the, cinco, the first knockdown seis, was a situation where siete, he was throwing a punch and ocho. got caught with that same uppercut that we've been seeing all night this is, by Alexander. This is where you see the risk versus the reward. Alexander, Devin Alexander took a risky proposition trying to fight in an excellent professional style without running, without holding, taking offensive chances responsibly. And rather than start to run or cave or get reckless when Urango started putting on the pressure, Alexander stuck to the game plan and look at that dividend it just paid. Urango stopped for the first time in his career. In his last fight, Alexander won his first belt. He'll keep his belt tonight and take home Juan Urango's. Well, let's look at the first knockdown in round number eight. Lennox, as you pointed out, it was Urango throwing a punch, coming in, dipping that head, and boom, the uppercut. Oh, see, that's the punch that he missed with. And that punch was coming from left field. And you don't want to get hit. When, you, when you're winding up throwing a punch and you get hit at that moment, that's like a shocking punch. Boom, like he got shot. You pointed out earlier in the night, he dips his head in, and Alexander that time timed it perfectly. Another look at it. Yeah, exactly. Anytime he's moving to punch, he always makes that dip first. And like I said, the, the uppercut is a great punch in this fight. All right, here comes knockdown number two. Here in round number eight, shot right to the temple, and then Alexander, nice and patient, and again, fires that uppercut. And I don't even think the uppercut really landed. I think it was that right hand to the temple that had knocked off his equilibrium. Let's see it again. Right there. Look, he no, that uppercut landed. It did, but not to the effect of the other one. No, but you have to remember, the first uppercut was the worst uppercut. Then if you touch him again, he's already been hurt from the first uppercut, so the second uppercut's going to affect you even more. The incredible story of Devin Alexander continues in victory. 20-0, and 0, his 13th stoppage for the official time of the stoppage. Here's Michael Buffer. Ladies and gentlemen, a referee Benji Estevez calls a halt to the bout. The official time. One minute, 12 seconds, round number eight. The winner, and now officially, the unified WBC IBF undefeated super lightweight champion of the world, Devin Alexander the Great. 
Yeah. Alexander was certainly great here tonight as we take a look at the final copy box numbers. Take a look at the total punches in the fight, and you see that Alexander was busier. He used his jab, landed at 33%. As far as his jabs were concerned, he was at 27% through 358 jabs of those 530. And you see he landed 96, 27%, but he was able to keep Urango at bay. And on to the power numbers in this fight, which is Urango's forte with those big hooks to the body. He was busier in that category, but look at the accuracy as far as connects, 45% connection for Devin Alexander and the powder, Corey. And that was one of the keys. And you know what? We showed you the punch zone earlier in the night, the uppercuts to the head. We saw him finally finish it off with that same punch, the uppercut that got the first knockdown in round number eight. And then Alexander at just 23 finished him off. He's standing in the ring with Max Kellerman. Devin, congratulations on a sensational performance. What are you feeling right now? Oh, man. First of all, I want to thank God. First of all, he gave me this victory. I want to thank my mom right here. She stuck, she, she's, the, she's the most amazing woman in the world. In the world. Ms. Alexander, I know you didn't want Devin to box when he was a boy. How do you feel about his boxing now? Steel skirt. <laughs> I love her. Kim, oh, man. This is my man. I, I, I can't say too much. Say say that much about him. He, he's, he's good. He, he, he's just, he's a an angel in heaven. You know, he's, he 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 the one that got me this opportunity. In the first round, you seem to be having your way. You box brilliantly early. Urango started to catch you with some right hooks. Yeah. At the end of the round, yeah. when you got back, Kevin Cunningham, your trainer, seemed a little concerned. What did he tell you? Oh, he told me to stay focused because I saw a little blood. You know, he told me to stay focused. Because when I see blood, that's when I want to go out and take him out. But he told me to stay focused, stick to the game plan, and I had his IBF belt, and I did. You are choosing to fight in a laudable style. You're not running. You're not holding. Right. You're choosing to do the hardest thing in boxing, stand right in front of your man, slip and counter, right. stick to the game plan. There are risks involved. Right. When he started to touch you as the fight wore on, what were you thinking? I mean, he started touching me, I agree, and my coach told me, don't stand right there. They want the game plan for me to stand right in front of him. He only can hit me if he planted his feet. As um, long as I'm moving, he wouldn't be able to touch me. So that's what I did, and I came out with victorious. Did you feel that the fight was turning at all in his favor as the fight wore on? No, no way, no way, because um, his punches were not hurting. His punches did not hurt at all. Um, I was surprised about that because everybody's saying he ain't hard. He's the hardest puncher at 140, but no. What adjustment did you make as the fight wore on to start getting out of the way of that right hook? Well, I still use my speed. Speed kills anything. Um, I know he's a brawler. He's going to come to fight. He's going to keep coming. So I decided to use speed, and that's what I did. I want you to, to, to describe this knockdown to us. It seemed to come out of nowhere. Tell us what was going on here. Well, the, oh, the, playing, the TV just went out. That's, what, that's Urango's point of view of the knockdown. The TV just went, uh, went out. You zapped him. Here it is. Right. Oh, you, oh, man, that's the punch we've been working on all camp, baby. That's, that's the left hand and the uppercut. We knew he was going to be wide open for it. That's what we worked on the whole camp, I tell you not. You are not making any uh, pretense about it. You are a St. Louis fighter, right. and I know you're interested in fighting in St. Louis and developing a, right. a following right. there. What do you have to say to St. Louis right now? St. Louis, I know y'all supporting me, and we coming back the next fight, and we gonna put 23,000 in the stadium, whoever. Now, I, before we end this interview, I have to ask you to flex for the camera. I don't know if people have seen this. This is kind of freakish. Let's see the bicep. Yeah, one more time. Yeah. Pull it up, Cam. That's what I hit him with. The uppercut, baby. Any interest in Timothy Bradley in a fight, if not a flex off? Look, this is the hardest person at 140, and I can beat anybody. I say if I beat him, I can beat anybody. Zab, Timothy Bradley, whoever can come get it. Congratulations. Sensational Devin Alexander. Congratulate Devin Alexander on his win tonight. He looked good tonight, but we know who holds the title in the loop. You know what? That's it. We know the Zab is, re is referring to the fact that he beat Corey Spinks in St. Louis. Are you interested in avenging Corey Spinks' loss hey, to Zab Judah? Zab is past tense. I'm present tense. Hey, I'm the future, and it's going to stand away for 10 years straight. Thanks. Arthur Page, St. Prince, Arthur Page, St. Louis.
Hey, we coming back, baby. Congratulations. Just this quickly, we will see who's the future at 140 in the not too distant future. I think it's safe to say, based on the resume, that Tim Bradley still currently leads the pack, but it's going to be impossible to ignore Devin Alexander after this performance. Bob? All right, Max. Well, Devin Alexander makes a statement tonight. We started this night off talking about the 140-pound weight class and the muddled picture of all the talented fighters. And against a guy like Juan Urango, he stepped up in class as far as he was concerned, the toughest test of his career. And he beat Urango at his game in the power game and in the later rounds. Well, an exciting night here at the Mohegan Sun, setting up a very exciting spring here on HBO as we look at the boxing calendar. Next week on HBO Pay-Per-View, Cowboy Stadium plays host to one of boxing's best pound-for-pound -pound fighters. Manny Pacquiao is back off his impressive 12th round knockout of Miguel Cotto. Pacquiao beating Cotto to the punch now. Now Kenny Bayless does his duty. His newest challenge is Ghana's Joshua Clotty in the biggest opportunity of his career. That's Pacquiao Clotty next week on HBO Pay-Per-View. March 27th on Boxing After Dark. Last June, Marcos Maidana pulled off the upset over up-and-coming Victor Ortiz. Oh, big right hand by Maidana. Now he takes on another highly touted youngster, Victor Cayo. On April 10th, it's another big night of boxing programming on HBO. It's the return of undefeated welterweight title holder Andre Berto. His opponent, former 147-pound titleist Carlos Quintana. Also that night, it's the return of the Emmy Award winning 24-7. This time around, our cameras follow two of the sport's brightest stars, Floyd Mayweather and Shane Mosley, as they prepare for their May 1st mega fight. On April 17th, a special edition of World Championship Boxing. Two fights from two countries and four all-action fighters. First up from Montreal, Canada, fan favorite Lucien Butte takes on knockout artist Edison Miranda. Then from Atlantic City, middleweight champion Kelly Pavlik returns to the ring against the slick Sergio Martinez who comes off his fight of the year candidate against Paul Williams. On April 24th, Boxing After Dark is back in a big way. Heavyweight Chris the Nightmare Areola continues his push for another title fight. His opponent is former light heavyweight and cruiserweight champion Thomas Adamick. On May 1st, HBO Pay-Per-View presents two of the best fighters of their generation. After a brief retirement, Floyd Mayweather dismantled the great Juan Manuel Marquez. What a return to the sport. Now he takes on the biggest challenge of his career. There's a big left hook. Shane Mosley has annihilated Antonio Margarito. It will have been 16 months since Mosley's destruction of Margarito. Now the future Hall of Famer has the fight he's been waiting for. An exciting few months in the ring on HBO's World Championship Boxing, Boxing After Dark, and Pay-Per-View. Well, not only do we have a great spring for you as far as boxing action, but we are so pleased to unveil a new miniseries, a 10-part miniseries starting in March. Here's a sneak peek of the Pacific. History is full of wars, fought for a hundred reasons. But this war, our war, well, I want to believe, I have to believe, that every step across that airfield Every man that's wounded, every man I lose, that it's all worthwhile because our cause is just. You better get me. We have to go out there tomorrow. If you've missed any part of tonight's telecast, you can catch it in its entirety at the dates and times listed below. Next on HBO, stay tuned for Road to Dallas, Pacquiao versus Claudi, followed by How to Make It in America, and then Magic and Bird, a courtship of rivals. So now for our entire HBO crew, I'm Bob Papa saying good night from Central Connecticut.
This has been a presentation of HBO Sports.